Okay. Okay. This is CS235 of Applied Robot Design for those of you who are now robot designers. Whoa. Didn't see that one coming, did you? <laughs> this is lecture 13, and today we're going to be talking about a lot of various things. Unfortunately, we have um, something to take care of first, which is a little unfortunate. We'll see if my audio ends up working. Any of you, uh, when you were teenagers, watch game shows, particularly terrible, horrible British game shows? Well, I did. Oh, God, that was really loud. So let's get that a little softer. Okay, so imagine a redhead. So um, it has come to my attention that someone or some peoples are cheating in our class on SOLIDWORKS, um, probably by farming it out to someone who isn't in the class to do their share. So, just to remind y'all of what the honor code says about this, I'm going to read it to you. The honor code is an undertaking of the students, individually and collectively. One, that they will not give or receive aid in examinations, that they will not give or receive unpermitted aid in classwork, in the preparation of reports or in any other work that is to be used by the instructor as the basis of grading. Two, that they will do their share and take an active part in seeing to it that others as well as themselves uphold the spirit and letter of the honor code. Then it goes on about the faculty, which is uh, Dr. Salisbury and myself, but the part I'm interested in are parts one and two. Part one is each of you has to do 100% of your own work. Part two is, if you are doing 100% of your own work, but you know someone else is not, in a way you have an obligation to ferret that person out and let uh, me know about it so that I can take care of it. So the reason why I have chosen the weakest link clip is that is my personal opinion, uh, may not be shared by all, that a Stanford degree is only as good as the weakest link with a Stanford degree. That is, if someone is a cheater and graduates, but didn't learn anything from their classes and goes out and does terrible work, then I look bad and you look bad and Dr. Salisbury looks bad and anyone who's ever gone to Stanford looks bad. Collectively, we live or die together on our collective reputation. So, um, I would like to not have to do any extra measures of security in terms of SOLIDWORKS. We are looking into this and uh, we are going to find them. Uh, if I don't find them by the end of lab three, we may have to have a two-hour SOLIDWORKS final exam just to, you know, basically make sure that person fails that uh, exam. Um, but I don't want to do that. So basically, if anyone has knowledge, you can send me a carrier pigeon with an anonymous note or smoke signals with the person's name. Um, but uh, if anyone has information, you're actually obliged by the honor code at some level to tell me or Dr. Salisbury in some way. It doesn't have to be one-on-one, -on -one. it can be anonymous. I would hope it would be anonymous because it's probably a pretty awkward conversation. So anyway, that's a reminder about the honor code. Um, a few more administrative things. Any questions about the honor code? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure. If I did know how they were doing it, I would be that much closer to stopping them, but uh, they're pretty good at it. Um, I had an anonymous report. Unfortunately, said anonymous report didn't really give me any tips other than, hey, someone's cheating. <laughs> it's like telling the Oakland PD, hey, someone got murdered last night. They're like, yeah, we know, 100, 120 people got murdered last night. <laughs> so um, the reason why I mentioned the section two is clearly someone knows someone's cheating because otherwise I wouldn't know about it. I mean, the instructor is almost always the last person to know about cheating, unfortunately. So someone knows, and if you're too shy, you know, that's between you and your conscience, but you do have an ethical duty via the honor code to, to let me or Dr. Salisbury know as much as you know so that we can catch the perpetrator. Any other questions? Okay. So um, someone asked me a good question, which is, uh, are we laser cutting everything in this? Yes. Yeah, that's totally fine. So basically, this is the reasonable thing. You know, this is the whole uh, on many different subjects, including the Supreme Court, and I won't go into it because I'd probably get fired for doing it. Um, I know it when I see it. So um, 
you're, you're not going to have any question, right? If it's cheating, it's cheating, and it's not like particularly gray, it's more Boolean. So what I mean is someone's not making their models. So, you know, if you were to copy from a friend um, their file and you actually didn't do it yourself, that would be cheating. If you farmed it out to, you know, someone you pay the money to do it for, that wouldn't be cheating. Basically, if 20 clicks are required for the CAD and you didn't do 20 clicks with your own hand, then it's cheating. Any other questions? I don't, I don't want to be severe about this, and this is probably the least, this, the least fun part of my job, even more so than dealing with our neighbors. But um, <laughs> if I could pin the cheating on them, believe me, I would. It would kill <coughs> two birds with one stone. So someone asked me if all of the parts in uh, Lab 3 are laser cut because they noticed that there's a two millimeter sort of slot cut out of two parts. Does anyone know the answer to this question? Rastered. It's rastered. So there's something called depth milling or uh, rastering, which is basically you don't power the laser at 100%. So typically, if this was a hole, you know, I'd go around at a pretty high power and cut, cut it all the way through. You can imagine if I only went at 10% power, it wouldn't cut all the way through. So now what I can do is say I wanted to make this hole but not all the way through, I could take tiny little swipes with the laser like this at a low power and high speed, like say anywhere from 1 to 10%. And then I think in your lab, the distance between these lines is around uh, 5 thousandths of an inch. And so, that, you know, it's not particularly precise, so you're not going to be... Uh, well, it's precise enough in terms of the shape, but the depth is very imprecise. So, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeters is the best you can do. But uh, what it lets us do is there's clearance. So if we need a bolt hole, uh, a bolt head that's going to just go into here, or you know, for Lab Three we're running a cable through here, so it doesn't need to be that precise. So yes, we're laser cutting all the parts for Lab Three, uh, but the way we're doing it is through rastering or depth milling. And this is how you see people graving unicorns on parts for 218 girlfriends and boyfriends and Christmas ornaments. What about the countersink? That's just with the hand counter sink. Okay, so that's lab three. If you guys have lab three questions, please save them until after lecture. We've got a lot to get through. Okay, so it occurred to me that um, we introduced, well, I introduced some new concepts in lab three without really explaining them beforehand. And that may not be the nicest thing. So let's, um, today is going to be spent basically talking about those things. So the first thing I would like you all to note is um, basically the transmission method. So when I spin this little thing, has everyone here watched the video hopefully? Okay. So when I spin this shaft, a cable transmission, and Rob, can you please zoom in down on the prototype? And Thanks, David. Sorry. So zoom in on the back of David's head. So uh, this is a cable transmission. Does anyone know what this type of transmission is? It's a four bar, but a more general term would be this is a rigid linkage. So this bar right here and this bar right here and here as well are rigid linkages. It's not a cable, it's not a belt, it's not a gear, it's just a link or a linkage. Um, rigid linkages are one of the oldest, if not the oldest, mechanical transmission ever. So in it, all it is is a bar with some number of holes in it, or it could be a cylinder and Maybe the holes are in the ends, like that. But uh, the point being that it's a rigid bar of material. So uh, cables and belts only work in transmission. What about rigid linkages? No? OK. Uh, cables and belts only work in tension. Oh, Yeah, it, it also works in compression. So we can either yank on it, we could say, you know, I want to move this hand and this hand can pull it. I could move it that way or I could push it the other way. If we push on it, what is a potential problem? Yeah. Buckling. Remember, this is not, um, well, it's part of material, you know, uh, a function of material, but it's also mainly a function of your geometry. Typically, your geometry will cause buckling well before the loads that would cause compressive failure. Okay, so um, 
Rigid linkages, as I said, are old as, as time, and they're everywhere. And so I'm not going to give you a comprehensive list of where you can find them, but I thought I'd give you a few fairly interesting um, usages of them. Um, so one usage is pretty obvious, which is this prototype. So uh, Annie said this is a four-bar linkage, which is correct. It actually has two four-bar linkages in it. So let me draw that on the screen. Oh. Okay, so this is this is a four-bar linkage. These are each revolute joints, and you can see if I move this bar, they all move, right? And they 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 move uniquely. So I see one, two, three, but not four bars. Where's the fourth bar? Ground. Ground. I'm actually going to call that zero. So a four-bar linkage. Um, this is like as deep as you get in terms of mechanical design. Bernie Roth has an entire course devoted to nothing but, as I'm told, planar four-bar linkages. And it's really fun, and you should take it. Also, his, his advanced kinematics class is really fun, too. But it doesn't do much of that. It does a lot of screw theory. Um, now, parallelograms are used quite often. Parallelograms are a special case of four-bar linkage, where it's parallel. And um, so the way this works, oh god, it's playing. So the way this works is um, these two bars here are parallel, and then it's moving uh, this bar. And then we have another uh, parallelogram here between this bar, these two, and this one. So a parallelogram is a special case of a four-bar linkage. And then uh, it's rotating about this tip. This is the remote center motion. And that is a special subset of combining two parallelograms to get that motion. Now, if any of you are, are uh, you're not going to have an intuitive sense for this unless you're some type of whiz kid at it. It took me a while to sort of figure this out. But there's hope. Uh, there's a friend of mine who graduated from our lab a couple years ago named Kevin Loki, and he has developed an iPhone app called 4Bar. And uh, it's not just, hey, hey. Okay, so basically what it is is you've got the red, green, and blue bars, and then, um, I don't know if you can see, there are little gold stars that appear on the screen, and you have to expand the linkages and move the endpoints so you can make this dot the centroid of the green bar go through the stars. So in, in, in all seriousness, if you have an iPad or an iPhone, you really should download it just because it will actually, like, once you've beaten the game, it takes about half an hour. Plus it makes cool little noises. See, it goes through the stars. So the two stars, and you have to move it to get that trajectory. So this is a game, but this was also many elderly people's professions in the World War II era. Because uh, before we had electric motors where we could have serial linkages with arbitrary kinematics, this is how they did everything, quite literally. They would have rigid linkages, often four bar linkages, and they would need you know, a computer to move an engine block some way around like this. And so what they would do is they would go through the math and figure out um, you know, if that cin green centroid was carrying a load, it, they would figure out where to put the linkages uh, to make it go through the exact uh, trajectory they wanted. So. This is like classic mechanical engineering at its finest. And again, it's on iTunes. So, so what's the idea? You want to make low vertical? We have rotary motion and you want to have something more? <coughs> well, look at the um, trajectories here. That's a very special trajectory. So it's not you know, for linear motion or for mm -hmm. that motion. It's for just about any motion you want. I mean. Um, the nice thing is you only have three rigid links that you have to build, and you can get extremely complicated motion with no motors, no encoders. You could even have a hand wheel that does it. So this was, this was like the non-electronic way of getting random trajectories back in the day. And again, you're not going to understand it until you actually play with them yourself. And the other way you can do it is just get yourself some Legos and play with those. But in lieu of Legos, which you all hopefully have ordered by now, um, you can play Kevin Loki's app. 
Okay, so rigid links are great. So let's look at these rigid linkages. Rob, please zoom in. As any of you, and hopefully all of you, have opened Lab 3 thus far, you will know that these are just uh, ball bearings with, with uh, shoulder bolts through them. But can you imagine instances where I might want non-planar motion from rigid links? Anybody have an example for me? Non-planar. This is all on a plane, and this is great. This works you know, very well. Something besides one degree of freedom. Well, I'll just I'll go straight to it. So that's a planar um, rigid bar linkage. And now let's look at a non-planar one. <clears throat> Anybody know what this is? RC car. RC car. Believe it or not, RC cars are like a fine uh, example of much uh, robotic transmissions. I'm really quite serious. Like I go to the RC car place all the time and look at stuff to see if I can get because they everything's cheap and miniature and doesn't break. Okay, so um, mm -hmm. which store do you go to for this? Sheldon's, S H E L D O N. It's in uh, somewhere Sunnyvale slash um, San Jose ish. They have two of them, so if one store doesn't have it, the other one might. So this is a common thing right here, which is. This uh, turning, rigid linkages are often found in steering mechanisms of planes and cars, and especially RC cars. Now this looks planar, right? Okay, so let me flip it and show you the way this works. And you'll have to see me, tell me if you can see. Um, no, I'm okay, but can anyone actually see this? From, from my vantage point, it's pretty dark. Dark. Can, uh, can you please get the lights, all the lights in the back? I lacked, ooh, I lacked the forethought to actually bring a flashlight. Okay. That's worse, yeah. One by one, turn them off. Okay, let's stop there. You see this little servo in my fingers? That's rotating about this axis, okay? Let me zoom out, this axis. But it's steering the wheels, so this servo controls this rod here and makes that motion. And if you, it's kind of hard to see and you're welcome to come after class and play with it. So, can you see, you see right in the middle right here? So that, this rod connects up here to steer it and this rod comes over like this and connects to the servo. Ah, that'd be awesome. Bike light to the rescue. By the way, you know they'll give you a $180 ticket if you don't have one. Sometime when I'm not your uh, lecturer, I'll tell you a story of me doing illegal things <laughs> with a bike light. Sorry, I sucked on your bike light. Okay, actually, can, can you hold this, please? <laughs> it's been in your mouth. I should have had a four-bar <laughs> linkage for holding all this crap. Okay. Oh, it's like perfect. Okay, so this is the servo horn. You see when I rotate that, it moves this linkage here. Okay, and then that moves this point right here. So everyone see that bar moving? Okay, and then as this bar rotates, it turns the wheels. So the end of this bar and the end of this bar are uh, changing angles in two planes. Does everyone see that? So this is an example of using a rigid linkage uh, out of plane. See, everyone see that? This is rotating so it, the, this point is going up and down like this as well as this way because it's going in a circle. So this link is changing all types of angles. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so um, the way to get around, uh, so w would that rigid linkage with those bearings and shoulder bolts work? is my question. Because I'm changing about two, two axes, right? I'm moving that point in two planes. So would that, uh, would just bearings and shoulder bolts work? No, it wouldn't. Because that bearing is only good for one plane, one axis of motion. So the solution 
is uh, called spherical bearings and or um, swivels. Okay, so let's look at these. So, this is a rod. Cool. And then let's look at the ends here. So, see how I can rotate that? See? I can put it there, I can put it there, I can put it up. These are called rod ends. Um, this is another example. So right now it's pretty aligned, but I can move it over there. I can move it over there, I can point down. Um, and these are just big versions thereof. So these, let me write down the terms for you because it's pretty important. If you want to buy these, you need to know what they're called. Okay, so they might be called rod ends, ball joints, swivels, sphere, equal joints, slash bearings, and then you can mix and match as appropriate until you, someone understands says, ah, it's on aisle three. Okay, so there are two things that, that this does for us. Say our laser cutting was slightly off. Would this work? Say yeah, some of you for lab two had bad laser cutting and, and uh, who had the wonky wheels where the plate kind of, yeah, you had the wonky wheels. It wasn't as fun as the Wonka movies. Um, so basically sometimes the holes won't be aligned quite right. And so maybe this is one axis and the other axis is cocked at an angle. So then these bearings wouldn't work very well, right? So, but if you used a rod end, then it wouldn't care. And that slight amount of misalignment is not going to change much in terms of the precision at the end. It's just going to mean your bearings are going to have a very short life. So you could use a rod end for that. Also, say um, you want to be able to adjust this mechanism on the fly. Right now it's laser cut. The holes are the holes and they're not changing after the laser cut. But this has little screws on it. So I can undo this and make it longer. I can make it shorter. And as long as I measure with calipers and I keep these even, then I can actually adjust my mechanism on the fly, which is sometimes nice for prototyping. But particularly, so these are good for planar stuff too. Don't think it has to be just for out of plane. But they excel in out of plane stuff because otherwise you just can't do anything. Um, now let's talk about someone tell me, I'm going to beat you to the punch and just tell you these don't have little balls in them. They're not ball bearings. So does anyone know what the term is for a bearing that doesn't have balls in it? Ballless bearings. Those are all good suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> Neutered bearings is also a valid solution. So these are called, um, one person said bushing. If we were talking about a one degree of freedom rotary thing or a one degree of freedom prismatic thing, that could possibly be correct. So keep that in mind. A more general term is a plane bearing. Now ball bearings work on rolling. What do plane bearings work on? Just sliding. sliding. Friction is not what makes them work. Friction is a bad side effect. So sliding, and then we have friction. What else do we have? Play. So um, the amount of play in a, sl in a plane bearing is typically a lot higher than in a ball bearing. So play, can everyone see this? Or wobble? Can everyone see this? Rob, can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. At a much smaller level, aren't ball bearings just the same? <laughs> they are. Tip. This is one of those things, and I don't know, and if one of you can come back and answer another week, then, I don't know, I'll give you a dollar. Um, I'm not sure if it's, it, 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 the, the, same, the principle is the same, right? If things fit together, then there has to be some space in between them. Now, we can preload it. So we could take, often ball bearings are preloaded. So they take things that shouldn't fit and smush them together until they do fit. And so there's some elastic deformation that takes place so that there actually isn't play. Um, you can't really do that with plane bearings. It doesn't work well. It increases the friction too much. But you know, whether it's uh, a lack of preloading, whatever it is, 
uh, the side effect is plain bearings have a lot more play than ball bearings do. And yeah. What's the difference between those and ball bearings and linear bearings? We'll go over that another week. There are like a thousand terms for different types of linear bearings, and everyone, every manufacturer uses different terms, so it's a really deep rabbit hole. Okay, so um, rod ends are cool. What's the problem with rod end? Slash spherical bearing. Well, let me draw it for you. So this is typically how they work. Okay, so what's the name for this? Let's, let's draw analogs between ball bearings and these. So this would be what? This is the outer race. And then this is the what? <coughs> Inner. Now they often don't call it a race, but you know, whatever. Or this might just be called the ball. And I'm going to put a shaft right here. I'm also going to give the shaft this Sony cam. <coughs> Can this turn 360 uh, like this? No. So at some point, we're going to hit the limit. Okay. So they're, they're good for um, finite and limited rotation. What about, about this axis? That's fine. We can keep going as many times as we want. But basically, like this or like this, it's finite rev uh, revolutions. So any way to maximize the amount of space we have here? Um, let's say we just want to buy this from McMaster and I want as much space as I can and let's say that I don't know everything else we've been doing is eight millimeters so let's say this is eight millimeters what can I do to get higher travel make the ball bigger so let's uh, let's I will have the width of this marker be my shaft okay And then I'm going to draw my little race here. That's going to have extremely limited play, right? I mean, you probably can't even see I've drawn the different parts. Because, uh, here, I'll draw it a little bigger. Okay, so right here, we could go to about there. Okay, so that looks to me... What do you think? Maybe, yeah, about 90 degrees. Okay, now I'm going to keep the same width. Okay. It's a lot more. I've drawn it poorly, so it doesn't look like a lot more. Here, let's fudge it. Because I can, and I don't actually have a McMaster part number for this. Let's let's say we've got like a gigantic ball. Yeah, there we go. So that's almost 180. This looks terrible. <laughs> the good news, the de the deer will live. Um, does everyone see this? I guess I could at least use a different color. <laughs> this isn't an art class, so we're good. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw it in, in um, there we go, that's more believable. So that's almost 180 for the same width of shaft. Does everyone at least understand the concept irrespective of my inability to draw? So basically, if you need x degrees of rotation and you're constrained in terms of the size of the shaft, you get a bigger ball. And typically, the, the, they keep the race about the same dimensions in terms of this width. They don't make it come in, you know, larger uh, with the ball. So, because um, if the whole thing scaled up, it would still work, but not as well. Typically, they keep a thin outer race here and they, they just have a, a really large ball. So. If you want to maximize rotation, get a bigger ball. Or 
Now let's say we do have flexibility, you can also make the shaft smaller. So either will work. Either the shaft is smaller or the ball is bigger. Either one. And sometimes I've done a combination where I'll be like, alright, maybe I won't go with 8mm, I'll go with 5mm. So you kind of split the difference, right? You get the biggest ball that master orders and the small shaft that you can use and that maximizes the radial reach or the angular reach. Okay, just a few other things where these little guys exist. This is a clamp. Rob, can you zoom in? So, I don't know if any of you can see. Uh, this is a little ball, and I'm able to go one, two, and then three. So this is a true spherical joint. Uh, just you know, people will often say that yaw and pitch is also a spherical joint, even though it, we don't have uh, the roll. You know, it's a functional definition, right? So. Anytime someone tells you that they have a spherical joint, you need to actually find out what the degrees of freedom are because that's pretty important. Um, so you see these a lot in tripods. Okay. Now, um, I found this fascinating, so I'm going to share it with you. These things, a rod end bearing, is also known as a heim joint. H E I M. Anyone know why? other than Wikipedia said so. Okay, it's also known as a heim joint in North America or a rose joint in the UK and elsewhere. It is also called a mechanical articulating joint. Such joints are used on the ends of control rods, steering links, tie rods, or anywhere a precision articulating joint is required. Blah, 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 blah. History. The spherical rod in bearing was developed by the Germans in World War II. When one of the first German planes to be shot down by the British in early 1940 was examined, they found this joint in use of the aircraft control systems. Anyway, I just, you know, thought that was interesting. Um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> look, look up the Wikipedia article. I didn't get that far. I hate reading, so. After a paragraph, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I think, I think, I think the Heim, whoever invented it in Germany for World War II efforts, I think his name was Heim. I think. I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know if any of this story is true. North America. Yeah, I'd never heard of that. I've only ever heard of this as a rod, a rod end or uh, a swivel or a ball joint, etc. So if you search for Heim, I doubt you're going to find much in terms of buying these. But if you're talking to a brigadier general, they might talk about it. <laughs> okay, one last interesting place where these are found. Uh, again, RC. This is an RC helicopter. And um, the, again, these are, when they talk about control rods, it's referring to stuff like this. Can everyone see this? That motion is brought to you by the letter H for Heim. So we have um, Oh man, where are we? Uh, there we go. You see this joint right here? It's a tiny little ball joint. So the other reason why these are plane bearings, not ball bearings, is you just could never build a ball bearing that small with that high of dexterity. And you're free to come and play with this after class as long as you're gentle, because it's not mine. Um, so you see these a lot in helicopters. And uh, anyone know a really super common way of controlling uh, controlling control rods? Feel free to shout out. If you whisper, I can't hear you. What type of motors do you see a lot of on these RC planes and cars? Servos. Servos. So, one of the most common ways of controlling these types of things is you'll have a servo, and that spins what's called, this is the servo horn, like a rhino horn. Even kind of looks like a rhino horn. Okay, and then say we'll put a, a, um, a ball end joint here, and then say these ball end joints. So the servo will move the whole thing back and forth. This is exactly what's happening here. These are all ball end joints controlled by servos. Okay, now, now comes the fun part. This may just seem like a random string of me babbling, which is true, but there's also a point to this babbling. Um, where else do I see rigid linkages? Planes, something in automobiles. 
drains. It's like it's like pulling teeth. Uh, okay. Is this on here? Uh, let's start with another one. Okay, so trains. So that's a rigid linkage. So one wheel is driving the other wheel, and there's a bar in between. That is a classic rigid linkage. Also, the internal combustion engine. In case you haven't noticed, I love Wikipedia. I don't read it. I just watch it. And if there aren't animations, I skip. So this is a this is a drive shaft. And that's a rigid linkage. We're rotating about that pin and that pin and getting linear motion in the piston for the car. So literally, if if anything, I, what I like to see from students is that you go out into the world and you see stuff moving. You're like, hey, I know what that is. That's called this, and that's how it works. So of all the things you've seen in this cl class where you're going to actually be able to identify what's going on, 90% of it's going to be rigid linkages. It's in your car. It's in trains. And then uh, if you're just interested, if you Google steam locomotive valves, these are all rigid linkages. All these little lines moving. And they're pretty fascinating. I don't know how all of them work, but they look pretty cool. So if you want to look at some cool stuff, you can look that up. Anyone know a problem with a uh, rigid linkage for a train? Can't choose your direction. No, you can choose your direction. You just spin the wheel the other way. Something else. One breaks the whole thing. Um, I'm looking more for a fundamental mathematical problem. And you feel free to channel Khatib. Yep. We lock in a singularity. What is the singularity? No, no. I, sorry. What, what is the specific geometry that leads to this singularity in this case? Okay. So what, here's one wheel, and here's a second wheel. So here is the rigid linkage. And these are the axes. So where should this rigid link be for me to hit the singularity? In line. In line with the axes. So if I were to do it here, then this would be the singularity. If you start there, yes. But we'll, we'll get to that in a sec. So I'm going to show you what this uh, singularity looks like. And can I get Rob? Can you zoom in on the, uh, the screen? And then come over here and... Okay. <coughs> Legos have ball and joint rigid linkages and they are sweet. Okay, see this? So, let me just show you this. I'm going to lock this. See this rotation? That's in internal motion of the, the rigid linkage ball joints. See that? Mm -hmm. Nothing's happening. So, what I have here, assume these are two wheels. They're not circular, but I just, I have some radius is connected to another radius and it's the same. So that happens. How is this different from a train wheel? Anyone? It's not. This is a train wheel precisely. So now I'm going to line it up here. This is the singularity, okay? So we got lucky that time, and that time we didn't. So this is basically, there are two valid solu mathematical solutions for these two wheels and this one rigid linkage. And at the singularity, if we breathe one way versus breathe the other way, we may see here we got lucky, and then here we didn't get lucky. So, if you were to CAD this up in SOLIDWORKS, do you think that this would happen? No. This will definitely happen 100% of the time. SOLIDWORKS handles singularities just like me breathing on it differently. If you were to literally CAD this up in SOLIDWORKS, half the time you drag it, it will be like this, and the other half it will be like this, depending on, I don't know, how your hand moves the mouse that particular time. So when you're doing stuff like this in SOLIDWORKS, you're going to have to add extra constraints. So typically, you know, what would be a good constraint between this bar and this bar 
to make sure we never had the bad kinematic uh, configuration. Yeah, make them parallel. Just so you know, that's dangerous, but uh, you have to do it if you do things like this in SOLIDWORKS. If it's possible that we could be elbow up or elbow down, it will sort of choose for us and, and we won't like the results. Oftentimes when you get into this case, your cat explodes and you have to like delete something and put it back in, so just be careful. Okay, does anyone know how trains get around this? Well, let me put that on there. They're not the same. By the way, this is why Legos are awesome, because you can make entire lectures out of Legos. Okay, so now I have two links. Can't happen, right? But what's the problem? Yeah. Choo-choo can't get very far. Little Thomas is stuck. <laughs> he ain't going to college. He's stuck in the coal mines. Okay, so we, we could use two linkages. Now, if all we wanted was finite revolutions uh, or finite motion, this would be perfectly fine, right? There's nothing wrong with this if all we wanted was... Um, a little under 180 degrees. Is there anything wrong with this if we want, say, 90 degrees? No, this is fine. But if we want continuous revolutions, this just won't work. So I looked it up so to save you the trouble. I think we're good. Now yeah, you can stay there. Um, what they do is they have two sets of wheels on either side of the train, and they phase shift on the train between the wheels. So these shafts go all the way between the two sides and then if the rod is here on one side it's here 90 degrees offset on the other side so when one side is in a singularity the other is not in a singularity and so it, it always gets it out of the singularity by the other side and this is called now if you google this it will probably bring up like only two websites which is kind of sad, but it's okay. This is called... Man, what is this called? Quad something. Quarter locked. The way this, this is called for trains is called quarter locking. So it's called locking because it refers to the, the seizing up in the singularity. And it's quarter because your quarter of a revolution phase shifted or 90 degrees. So this is... 90 degree phase shift. Okay? So just keep in mind when you're dealing with rigid linkages, often you'll get into some type of weird kinematic thing. This is not called a kinematic inversion. Okay? That's different. And often it's a functional definition. Don't think because we're going from one configuration to another, it's inverted. It's not called a kinematic inversion. That's something different. Okay? Now because Yes. Um, you can also have, so like you're seeing this shifted between two of them which are, are opposite to each other. Mm -hmm. Can you also get rid of the singularity if along the train you have it at a different angle? Not sure. I'm sure they tried everything in the book and they probably landed on the easiest first thing that worked, but I, I'm not sure. And until this afternoon, I knew very little about trains. <laughs> But how's that different from your first drawing? There are two of them. So this is two sets of wheels. So, um, like with this RC car, imagine this was a train. So, and we had a bar that made this wheel and this wheel go. And then on this side we have another bar that makes it go. And they're, they're uh, 90 degrees out of phase. So when one's locked, the other's not. So the other one that's not locked helps drive through the one that is locked. Okay, now, here's the thing. I'm going to skip to another topic real quick because I just showed you an example of something and I don't want you to get the wrong impression. Uh, chicken and egg, it's fine. Okay, so we just talked about spherical bearings. Is this a spherical bearing? Now, before you answer, I'm going to put in different configurations. Is this a spherical bearing? Yeah, this is a spherical bearing. What else is it? Welcome to Sony. Can you power off and on, please? Thank you. I better get some money from them. This is like... <laughs> although, I don't know if... It, maybe it'll just be a cease and desist from using their camcorders. Okay, so this is called a pillow block. This is called a rod end. 
And if I chopped, if I chopped it right here and took the threaded section off, it would just be a spherical bearing or a bushing, uh, a um, a swivel. So this is called a pillow block, and I'll write it down the board for a sec. Why do you guys think I want this? You can mount it. So I can mount it. Say that this board right here is the only thing I wish to machine, okay? But I want an axis that doesn't, can you zoom out please? The only things I can machine into this um, plate in this configuration is axes straight up and down, okay? But if I want a bearing 90 degrees, then I have to turn the plate 90 degrees. A pillow block lets me bolt a bearing down with holes that I machine directly into the face and then get 90 degree rotation. So let me draw it for you. Rob, can you switch back to uh, not, not that duty? And then I'll turn this off. So. Um, pillow box, anyone who's taken 218 has probably used these or at least been envious that someone else did. Pillow block. No clue where that name comes from. And so what this is, another term for this might be a mounted bearing. These bearings ride horses and dress up in costumes. Um, and so what this is, is basically you have a bearing, and this could be a ball bearing or a plane bearing or a one degree of freedom bearing or a spherical bearing. They are all the same name. And then you'll have Typically, something like this, where the bolts go down like this. Or conversely, you could chop these off and you could tap directly into here. Okay? And then here, this could either be a ball or it could be a ball bearing. And I'm going to show you this is a massive pillow block. Um, and this is the, like one dollar. So why don't you pass this around? Actually, why don't, why don't you hold it up for me while I videotape it? Oh. That's okay. Okay, you can sort of see it up there. See that? Rob, can you get that? So I can rotate this. And I can also bolt it down here. Pillow blocks are serious stuff. In terms of bearings, they're gigantic, but unlike ball bearing, you know, like typical ball bearings that are gigantic, they're super expensive. These things, for some reason, are super giant and super cheap. So, but they're awesome. Think, uh, plug, copper plug on the top. You tell me. Nope. These, see these black things here? Rob, can you actually see that on your camcorder? Little. Little? Okay. This, uh, here, I'll put it down. Is that a set screw? Nope, not a set screw. A what? What about lubricant? Yes, that's exactly what it is. If I had jello, I would give you some. <laughs> okay, so these black things here are set screws. And we have two of them. One and two. This gold thing is a lubrication input. So basically, uh, if it starts seizing up, you put more lubrication in it. These are very sensitive. So it's easy to knock them off and spill lube everywhere. So um, you have to be pretty careful with, please, don't use them for fixturing or clamping. Don't have anything collide with them. It will be very bad. Um, often with like industrial grade bearings and things that spin really quick for a really long time, you'll see lubrication channels like this. Um, and they'll specify where you put it. So anyway, that's a pillow block. Okay. Now we, we get off of our random sidetrack, I think. We're going to switch over to the laptop. I know this is a bit awkward keep switching back and forth, but I think this is the best way to do it. And I'm going to shut you out for a sec. Okay, so to review in terms of what we just talked about, we got rigid linkages, they're everywhere. They're very stiff, you can use them in tension compression, but it might have buckling. Um, we talked about rod ends and spherical ball bearings. One last thing about spherical ball bearings. They don't have to just be used for, you know, shafts rotating and stuff. 
I like to use them for lasers. So say I have a contraption and I want to point at something. And I want to point at something over there. So I would like to be able to rotate in two degrees of freedom. A compact way is to take, if this is my, okay, and we have a little bore. I personally like to stick a laser here and then I'm able to point it any which way I want. And the roll doesn't really matter. Now, what is the problem with doing this? Does anyone know? Yep. How do you control it? Oh, just manually. Oh, okay. But that's part of my, the answer I'm looking for. How do you control this? You fix it. But you may or you may not. So the secret is, because these are plane bearings, that play is really important. If you have too much play, it just falls over, literally. And so half of the ones I got from McMaster just fall over. And so when I put my laser pointing somewhere, it just so that's bad. And then half of them are so rigid that I actually can't, I can't even move these by hand. I've tried, it doesn't work. So as strong as I am to have ruined all of the things in the course in front of you this, thus far, I'm not strong enough to do this. So now I have to like take a rod and this is, I mean, this is a big lever arm. It's still pretty tough. So surely there's got to be something in between needing a rod like this and having it fall over. Anyone know what it might be? Well, I can set this to any angle I like and then clamp it and we're good. So basically what's in here is there's a little bit of plastic and when I, when I swivel this, this little lever, it pushes the plastic up and creates enough friction that I can't overdrive it. If you want really super ridiculously nice spherical joints with a lock on it, they're called um, ball heads, and um, you get them for camera tripods. So ball head tripod mount, something like that. The other answer is, um, let's zoom in here a little bit. So I'm going to, right at this interface, I'm going to zoom in over here, okay? So this is, this is the what? Yes. Outer race and inner race. This is either going to be gap or it's going to be material, but we can choose what that material is. Say we wanted something where we can set our laser in place and leave it. We don't want to have to use too much force, but we also don't want it to just fall over. Would you want this, what material would you want in here? Would you want steel? Plastic. So what you do is you take yourself a chunk of plastic and you put it in here and you compress when you insert it. So these are called lined and when you go on McMaster and look for ball joints or spherical bearings they'll give you the option for lined or not lined or unlined and so if that's just free air, it's going to fall over, or if it's not, if they just cram the crap out of it and it's steel on steel, it's going to be one of these where like, you need a really huge lever arm or crowbar to move it. If it's plastic lined, it's really just so beautiful because you need a little bit of force to change the angle, but not so much that it's uh, obtrusive. So I like the lined spherical bearings for things like lasers. Okay, enough about rigid linkages. What is that mechanism over there called? Please, I get tired of hearing my own voice. Someone, someone talk for me. This motion right here. RCM. It's an RCM or a remote sensor of motion. Remote center of motion. So let me explain what's happening. Our robot is rotating about this fixed point. And Rob, can you please come down and get all my little gesticulations? So this fixed point's not moving. We're rotating about it, but we're not translating. Okay? Now, I just put it here so you could see. These are really popular mechanisms in medical robotics because this point here we're trying to rotate about Say uh, we're doing laparoscopic surgery, so basically you'll take me and poke a big hole and then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put a long thin tube through me and um, say that 
this is my abdominal wall and we put a little hole and now we put a plug down here called a trocar okay so let's look at this this is my abdominal wall this is me this is not me <laughs> slash clean uh, and this is a hole called a trocar and what we're going to do is take uh, a surgical instrument that's very thin and we're going to put it all the way down and I don't know, maybe we'll put some scissors or pliers or cauterizing. This is how the, the Da Vinci intuitive surgical robot works. And so the thing is, this point allows us to rotate like this. Okay? Now it's limited rotation, but there is rotation. Now why wouldn't we want to put the center of rotation right down here deep inside me? Does anyone know? Yeah, because then this trocar would be moving back and forth. So we have S equals R uh, theta. We want S to be zero in terms of arc length, because otherwise my abdominal wall is getting ripped, quite literally. So uh, you always put the center of rotation in the middle of the trocar so that you're not pulling me back and forth. Say you're doing uh, eye surgery on a retina, where would you put the remote center of motion and assume you go through the pupil? In the pupil. So if this is your eye, and I know this is kind of gross, but you know, this is reality. So maybe you'll cut a slit and put the, so this is the cornea that we've moved back and this is the pupil. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite serious. So this is the pupil. We'll put the center of rotation right there. Remote center motions are pretty important. I do Robach IV insertion. I put the remote center of motion right at the surface of the skin. Okay, now, so now you know why we want a fixed rotation point. But this doesn't look remote, right? Like remote from what? Remote is supposed to mean remote from the robot. But my robot is touching the center of rotation. So what do I mean? Anybody know? No. It means that I just need an Allen key. Okay. So now I'm not at the center of rotation. And I... Here, hold on one sec. Okay. Now I'm not at the center of rotation. I'm not touching it. I'm nowhere near it. But my axes still intersect there. Okay. That's why it's remote, because the robot is remote from the center of rotation. So the reason in the movie I had it all the way down is so you could see the tip wasn't moving, but this is truly why we call it a remote center of motion. So remote is that the center of rotation is not changing no matter what you do to it? Exactly. Um, now, what else could we do here? Say we don't even want to touch the person. I could put someone's... Um, cancer-ridden prostate right here, and I could have a radiation beam right there, and I could zap the prostate. And say I want to zap from different angles. So um, if this is the prostate, then I could have my robot with a little radiological zapper, and this would zap an arc there, and this would zap an arc there, and this would zap an arc here. So you center on the cancer and you go from different angles. So that would be an example of you want the robot not to touch, but still to be pointed at one fixed point of rotation. Now, this is called mechanically enforced because I have rigid linkages that are forcing this, no matter what my motor does, to be about that center. Okay? Um, anyone know what it's called when it's not mechanically forced? Enforced? It's called virtual. So we could have a virtual RCM, or sometimes this will be called computed RCM, or so that's one, or we could have mechanically enforced, or constrained, or what have you. So let me tell you what I mean by virtual RCM. Given sufficient dexterity, say a wham arm, or maybe even a puma, I could um, point at that center no matter where, but I could also do whatever I want. So let's say we take a wham arm. I could play baseball with a wham arm, 
or I could put a radiological device in it and turn it into a remote center of motion by, by forcing it to always point at that point, right? So let's take my arm. My arm is a wham arm, and this is my, my radiological beam. So there's no reason why my arm has to be a remote center of motion. It can do whatever it wants. But now I'm going to compute trajectories such that uh, no matter where I am, I'm always going to be pointing at that center of rotation, right? So it's called virtual because there's nothing, there's nothing in the real world that forces me to be about that point. It's a virtual, it's computed. Everyone clear on this? Now, why might I uh, want a virtual as opposed to a mechanically enforced remote center of motion? Uh, I suppose so. Anyone else? Yeah, if you're striking one place. I heard a couple of different things. If you're dealing like with some part of the body that's expected to move, like if you have a laparoscopic point and they're breathing, you want that. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, if that point is changing and you'd like to be able to track it, you're going to need a virtual, or at the very least, you could do this by just moving the entire thing. But this might be easier. Um, so let's write a few things down here. This is safe in power loss. Okay? I mean, the juice isn't on right now. This isn't plugged in anything, but it's still constrained. This, if we shut down the power, is going to lose where it is. And my wham arm uh, is no longer there. Also, the, this requires super high resolution encoders and very well controlled motors. Because if it loses track of where it is, maybe it won't slice the cancer. Maybe it'll slice off your head instead. Uh huh. But if it's changing, if the point is changing, mm -hmm. then the mechanical enforcement doesn't make sense. Uh, it can, because assume that we have this. Uh, say all we're doing in uh, Kirk's example is someone's breathing. All right. Say we want to point at the ch uh, at the belly, and a person is breathing. So that means we want this rotation point, and we're just going to track it up and down, right? Like this. Now in power loss, my wham arm is going to do some strange things. But if I put this on a counterbalance linear slide up and down and power shuts off, then at the very least, it's not going to freak out. It's going to be somewhere on this line. Now it will it'll be projecting you know, somewhere wrong maybe, but it will be a lot... If it's all the way down, then that might hurt the person. So then you'd want back drivability. Safety is, is there are a lot of different facets to it. But, and, my, and this is my personal opinion, and anyone watching this who does virtual RCMs, I apologize. I don't like these as much because I don't think they're safe. I also don't think they're as reliable. Um, here, basically, what's the limit on the precision of this in terms of where that center of rotation is? My machining. The limit on the precision of where that point is for the virtual RCM is my encoder, the control loop of my motor, and I don't want to kick the robot and have it go, start vibrating and go unstable. Um, and also, it's just really expensive. I'm going to have to machine something anyway because it's a robot. So if I do mechanically enforced, I machine and it's done. With the, with the virtual one, not only do I machine, but I still have to have really super high resolution encoders. Uh huh. So this is the DaVinci mechanically enforced. OK, so let's talk about types of remote sensors of motion. That'd be fine. Probably. Yeah. So why would you go for something that you know where you literally constrain the robot's design itself to operate under certain conditions rather than having a more flexible robot and a massive constraint? Flexibility is a rabbit hole that graduate students use to publish papers, in my opinion. You want I want a test bed that's gonna be able to do X, Y, and Z and also alpha beta gamma. And it ends up sucking at all of them. So, and this is something that most grad students start, and maybe I'm wrong, and maybe you have a flexible design that's terrific. The more flexible my designs are, the worse they suck at all of the things I use, because everything has design trade-offs. And so if I make a design trade-off for one thing that I want to do, then that's a pretty good trade-off. But then if I make a design trade-off for every single application I have to keep it flexible, pretty soon I don't even know why I built the robot or why I made any decisions. So in my mind, for PhD research, you want to be as focused in on the one application you need it to be as possible to get your research done. Um, if you have, the more knobs you have to twist, 
the more knobs you have to twist poorly and to screw up. Well, um, I mean, I'm not a textbook. I just have my own experiences to go on. And my own experiences in watching others in my lab and elsewhere have been flexible designs typically work medi uh, at a mediocre level for everything, whereas very application specific typically works a lot better for one thing. And as I'm only concerned in my one dissertation, I design for my one dissertation. So let's talk about the type of remote center motion. This is a parallelogram or rigid linkage remote center of motion. Anyone know why? You have to answer. I just stated. Someone has to answer. It's made, it's a force. It's made of parallelograms and rigid linkages. So I happen to have a little Lego version. Okay, so here's the deal. I didn't really understand how these things worked because who builds half of a remote center of motion? That's just stupid. So, but you don't really understand how it works until you do build half of one. But Legos are great because you can build half in like 30 seconds. So, actually, Hannah, would you mind helping me please? Okay. So, um, okay, so this is, this is the exact same thing as Lab 3, right? Just out of Legos. Okay? So I have two things going on here. I've, um, I have, let's look at the angles. This bar is parallel to this bar, and also this one. And then these two bars are parallel to this one, right? There are two parallelograms going on here. So let's see what, what, um, what happens if we get rid of one. Okay, so this is what happens if we get rid of one of those control links. So this is floppy. It's supposed to be right here, right? Like this, but instead it's able to do this. So basically, what these two bars do is they make this bar parallel to this bar. See, it's always parallel. That's why you have these two bars. That's all they do. The reason why we then have a secondary bar is to set the angle of this. Okay, so now as soon as we add this one back on, okay, now this bar enforces parallelism between this end effector and this bar. Okay, everyone see that? That's why you have to have two parallelograms, not just one. And I forget this on a regular basis, and when I was first catting up lab three, my SOLIDWORKS was moving all crazy and I was like, why is this? And I'm like, ah, that's right, two parallelograms. Okay, now let's think about something else. This point right here is the center of rotation, that's the end effector. What motion are all of these links doing about that point? Or some point? Rotating. They're rotating. It's a circular motion. So just keep that in mind, right? This link is rotating about its tip and then these are obviously rotating about their axes, but everything is rotating in a circular arc. Thank you. Okay. So anyone know who came up with this, or at least who published first on it? Russ Taylor at JHU. His name pops up all across uh, uh, medical robotics. So that is a parallelogram, rigid linkage, remote center of motion. Anyone uh, know what the issue is with it? Uh, this is where it ends. It's very limited rotation and the, the corollary reflected on the other side. So there are two things. One is this type of remote center motion design that has very limited workspace and the other is if I put a, an electrical wire and or my finger it chops. This is a pinch point. This is a big no-no. Especially for medical stuff and industrial stuff. So let's look at a couple other designs. I'm going to show you the simplest, dumbest way of doing this. And in my bid for sh shameless self-promotion, I'm going to show you something I built. 
in the set at the marker kit. Whoa. Rotation up. Okay. So that is a, uh, a remote center of motion because the marker tip is at the center. The little U joint is um, one axis, and then we spin the entire U. Does everyone see how that works? Hopefully, I'll spin this in a second. <coughs> oh, oh, oh. I'm muting. Okay. YouTube is, is on its deathbed. So I'm going to draw up here for you. So if you wanted to build a remote center of motion and you didn't have geometric constraints, this is by far and away the simplest way to do it. So what you do is you have one U like this, okay? And then this is your axis. And then you have inside it something that can rotate back and forth. And then whatever your end effector is points at this point, okay? And say I have a marker or a radiological something. So I'm not touching this point, okay? And now if this is an orthogonal axis, I spin the whole thing about it. So I ha I'm twisting in this axis and about this axis, so I'm pointing at that point. This is far and away the simplest, dumbest way to do it. Everyone understand this? Okay. The problem is, remember I said I wanted to go into my stomach. Well, this is going to have to be one huge robot to get all the way around my torso, right? So if I tried to make this one-to-one -one and I stuck it on myself, I'm going to be doing this constantly. That doesn't work. I, I would have to have it go all the way around me. So this is bad just in terms of geometry. I mean, if it works for you, terrific, because you got lucky. But often, you know, this has to be huge for medical robotics. So that's, that's a limitation. Now there's another thing we could do, which is this. So this is all over the place. The person who holds the patent is Joel Jen Jensen at SRI. And this is also used in a bunch of robots at Hopkins. And what this is, is um, it's a parallelogram, a double parallelogram enforced by a cable or a belt instead of rigid linkage. Now, this is extremely hard to see, and I don't expect all of you to see it Come and play with it after class. These cables go between the different links to constrain the motion. Hannah, can I get your help again, please? Sorry. So I built a little one. Okay. It's okay. Sorry. Okay, so see this? So the tip is, so it's a little funky looking at a plane. The tip's not moving, that's just the camera perspective moving. So I can go all the way down and I can go all the way through. Okay, now let's, let's look, at, we've got one belt here and then a second belt here. So let me just go through how this works. Uh, this pulley right here is affixed to this link. So this belt rotates about a fixed link uh, on this base. And then this pulley is affixed to this moving link here. Okay? So basically, this one belt, all it does is it keeps this bar and this bar parallel. So this one belt keeps this bar and this bar parallel. Then I have a second belt. And it's connected to a pulley here. And this pulley uh, is connected... This, this is where it gets tricky. This belt is on this pulley, this pulley is on this shaft, and this shaft is glued slash press fit to this link, okay? And then this belt drives this pulley, and this pulley is attached to this last link. So, does anyone know what linkages I'm keeping parallel here? The end effector and what? One. This one, okay? So this belt here is keeping this link and this link parallel. And then this belt here is keeping this middle link and this last link parallel. Isn't this effectively the same thing, only instead of a second bar, you're using belts? Exactly. It is exactly the same thing. So there are two concentric, concentric axes there? Uh, yes. But someone tell me why. So, Shruti is correct. This is exactly the same thing as the double parallelogram rigid linkage, except what? More freedom and no push points. 
So the pinch points are, are at least mitigated. I mean, I could still do this. I mean, you can kill yourself with anything. They have Darwin Awards for that type of thing. But the pinch points are reduced, but mainly, thank you, mainly the inflection point is gone. So let me draw what I mean by that, because that's a little hard to see. Remember the workspace of that rigid linkage is very limited? It's not nearly as limited for this design. Okay, so this is one side. What is to keep this entire thing from swinging over to the other side? Anything? Nothing. If this was a rigid linkage, when these two uh, linkages get close to each other, it, it binds up, it does this, and we're done. Now imagine these were cables instead. I can go all the way down and around the other side. When this is lined up horizontally, that's called the inflection point. And it can go through that inflection point without skipping a beat. So take this entire thing, and we go up. This is the inflection point. And then we go on the other side. So I get more than, I get about double the workspace that I would, or double the, the um, angular motion I would if I used the rigid linkages. Does everyone understand that? I know it's, it's really difficult to see, but anyway. So feel free to play with that. Now this one doesn't go through the inflection point, I think because I stupidly made a shaft seriously long when it didn't need to be. Yeah, I did. Hey, you know what I can do? Oh. Can I get your hand again, please? Sorry, sorry. I'll show you the inflection point. Dude, this is money. Okay. Camera? Uh, no, this is patented in like 2001. They did this thing where you patent like every two years you change the name or do some witch doctory thing and they repatent it. They get the name of the game in medical robotics is patent stuff like remote center of motion to keep the little guy out. I have circumvented their patent and will not display it today, but in a couple years, look for it. Okay. <laughs> Shit. Because the other things, they are like 300 years old. Yeah. So SRI patented this to use basically cables, belts, any type of stringy thing. I mean, my wife's a lawyer, so I can say, and I love her dearly. When lawyers start collaborating with engineers, soon no one can enter the field because they've covered everything. I mean, you could drive this literally with a string of pearls or a bike chain, and SRI would still have the IP on it. So if you invent a new RCM, maybe you'll get rich or die trying. OK, so this is the remote center of motion. So this is about as far as we could go if it was a rigid linkage. Oh, snap. Look at that. <laughs> it goes through the inflection point. That's wicked. OK. Um, at some point, we have to actually physically support this. Also, my belt keeps coming off. But um, mainly, at some point, your fingers have to grab onto this thing. Maybe the answer is not. I don't know. I'll tell you what, if you want to fix my belt after lecture and then videotape it, then I will see the point. Typically, in my experience with remote center motions, at some point you have to make contact with the thing, and when you make contact, you can no longer support it. Nah, this is busted, so anyway, you saw it working. Everyone saw the inflection point? Okay. Okay. Does that design have a particular name? Nah. Just cable or belt, something. Okay, so let's talk about the next thing. So, cool. We've got a remote center of motion, and here we're doing it with rigid linkages. Why is this not falling over? Okay, other than the fact that I clamped it. Y'all are real smart because I clamped it. Uh, let me take this off. What do you mean Let me show you. Okay.
OK. So now it's no longer counterbalanced. So I can put it somewhere, and it falls over. OK. Why does this work? So I had told you a couple days ago that I told you a couple days ago that I could take a wheel and basically put a mass here and put a mass here and it would be counterbalanced, right? Well, this looks a lot more complicated to me because I have these bars. So why is it counterbalanced like this? In a way, they're all rotating in a circular arc. And I'll let you play with it and play with it in CAD. Because they're all rotating about a circular arc, I can counterbalance it. So I can counterbalance this because it's rotating about this point. I can counterbalance this link because it's about this axis. I can counterbalance this one because it's about this axis. And believe it or not, these links are rotating about a circle too, each, each of them. Now, it's not changing in orientation. I can take this marker and not change in orientation. And I can say I grab at the middle. I can go all the way like this. Is the center of motion, center of mass still about my elbow? Yes. Even though I could also do this where I change the orientation with respect to ground too. The center of mass doesn't care what my alignment is. I could even be spinning this thing while I rotate. And I'm still about this, my center of mass is still about this rotation so I can still counterbalance. Now the reason why I'm doing this, um, the reason I have a slot is if I were to take this plate off, this would now be lighter, right? And say I want to put an ultra channel probe on here, now it would be heavier. Well, I don't want to have to keep getting a different weight. And that's another story for you. I drove to like six different big fives this weekend to get you all weights for lab three. So say you're tired of going to big five, and you have one weight, but you want different end effector sizes. So if I move this, Rob, can you zoom in down here? If I move this weight up here, what's going to happen? It's going to fall the other way, hopefully. Like that, OK? Now it's too heavy over here. And then if I move it down here, which way is it going to fall? The other way. Okay. Now somewhere around here, the porridge is just right. Okay. So that's just fine. By having a slot, I can use one mass, and that one mass can counterbalance a range of different weights. Because making weights precisely is a lot harder than just moving a slot. Now um, let's let's look at something. Right. How about here? Uh, no, I'm going to move this all the way. So this is imbalanced. Why is this not falling over? Friction. 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 So the static friction in these uh, devices is due to the bearings and misalignments. Every time you misalign, that adds friction from the ball bearings. It means I have some zone over which this won't fall over. So if in my CAD I say, well, I actually need a one pound weight right here, well, not really. I have some range within which if I get, it will still won't fall over. Okay? So you can actually use that to your advantage. It means you don't have to necessarily, you can counterbalance like 95% of the mass. But if you don't have the extra 5% for whatever reason, you can use stiction. Actually to your advantage for once. Yep? So by saying you're doing it in CAD, you're actually putting in the masses. And yes. I didn't have you guys because I realized that this week's lab was really SOLIDWORKS intense. But I'm going to show you that in another lecture, how to do that. So if you're already doing that, you can probably just calculate the mass at the center and get the exact way to know what to do. Why do you need to experiment at that point? Because what is the density of plywood? Something. Something. I don't know what it is. Um, and it depends, I mean the thickness, I don't even know what thickness this is. I know roughly what the density and roughly what the thickness are, but it changes with every single batch. So depending on the batch, it's going to be different. So it doesn't matter, I can have a precise calculation, but if it's not based on real physical measurements of my particular material, it doesn't matter. So this gives me the flexibility, so when they bring me a light batch or a heavy batch, I can still counterbalance it all the same. Uh huh. So in the DaVinci, does it have a counterbalance or does the butter deal with it? I don't remember. Some of it's counterbalance, but I don't remember which degrees of freedom it is. The reason why you'd want to counterbalance like a medical robot is, say, power shutdown. You wouldn't want it to just drive into the patient. Or if it was, say, it had pliers, 
It's not going to translate, right? But say it had pliers and it was on something important, you wouldn't want it to take the pliers and go like that. So you want it counterbalanced. And again, we talked last time about the differences between springs and mass counterbalancing. I'm not going to go over them again because hopefully you all wrote that down even though it was sort of an aside. Did everyone write that down? Okay. Let's talk about materials. What material should we use for counterbalancing? Let's throw out some ideas. Steel. Steel. Pretty good. Yeah. What else? Lead. Lead. Okay. Lead's pretty heavy. What else? Huh? Not really. Sand. Sand. We could use sand. So let me give you a few words of wisdom, or maybe it's, it's not wisdom, it's more I've been burned repeatedly and have half destroyed my desk repeatedly doing bad counterbalancing jobs. Um, water is a common thing that people think of first. Don't do that. <laughs> Robots as well as neighbors hate water. Uh, sand, same reason. Basically, if it can get out of your robot and destroy anything nearby, don't use it for counterbalancing it. So, I like the idea of steel. Okay? So, I'm going to throw up here some densities. Hey, two minutes. Somebody remind me about PF, okay? Please? Rob, you're my PF man. Two minutes. Um, so, here are some uh, densities. Let's look at these closely. So, steel, well, we'll look at iron because it doesn't have steel. Iron is 7.87 grams per cc. And then, um, let's, someone said lead. Lead is 11.34. Okay. Molybdenum, bismuth, nickel, cobalt, cadmium, niobium. Do you think they sell these on uh, McMaster or at Home Depot? No. Does anyone know how to machine these materials? Not unless you're at like a special facility. Rhodium, I don't even know what that is. Mercury, how about mercury? Is mercury good? Mercury's bad. Tantalum, you can buy it on, on uh, specialty places, but it's pretty expensive. So let me break it down for you. Here's the deal. Don't use liquids. This includes liquid metals, such as mercury. Also, you need a special license to buy mercury, and your children will have weird, weirdness if you do that. So don't do that. Steel's good. You can machine steel to whatever you want. That's fine. Aluminum's too lightweight. Don't try. All these other things that you've never heard of, or maybe you have, but you can't buy, don't use those. Uranium would be terrific, and actually, I'm not joking, the military uses depleted uranium for some stuff, because it's really heavy. They used to use depleted uranium for, um, for bullet shells, and uh, like projectile shells, because it's heavy, and one half MV squared. But I can't get depleted uranium without being flagged by the authorities. Um, gold, silver. So silver is about comparable to lead, but it's real expensive. Actually, if you were really wanting to do a good job, you'd use platinum, right? Platinum is heavier than tungsten or mercury or lead or steel. By uh, I mean, it's platinum is three times denser than steel. Okay, and you laugh, but in World War II, they they actually used a crapload of silver for uh, for the um, Manhattan Project because it conducts electricity really well. Unless you're doing the Manhattan Project, you're not going to be using silver. So I'm just going to break uh, this to you. Tungsten right here. That's what you want your counterbalance made out of if you can. So I have a point of rotation and I have a mass. And this is my radius and the moment of inertia is roughly mr square. I say roughly because not everything's a point mass, but approximate your mass as a point mass and you get mr square, okay? So what does this mean? Or say this is my rod and this is my end effector and that's uh, this is my mass so my torque is mgr. I want my robot to be lightweight. I don't want to put a giant chunk of steel on it. So if I take a little chunk of steel and put it across the room on a lever arm for a, for a lighter weight robot, I get the same counterbalancing. So I want the smallest mass I can. Okay? I want the densest material I can, because otherwise my, to get that same mass, I need a huge volume. 
So that's why we want a super dense material. If we had in, you know, a, a, giant chunk, a, a little chunk of tungsten, we can put a little chunk of tungsten out here and counterbalance instead of having a gigantic chunk of steel. And we can play with these parameters in terms of density, size and shape of the counterbalance and where we place it. Uh huh. If the mass is the same, then, oh, you're trying to reduce the volume of your robot? Yeah. Okay. These things take up volume. I'll, on another year, I'll show part of my dissertation. I had to go with tungsten because I could not fit a chunk of steel that big enough in my robot to counterbalance it. So say we're constrained, um, because uh, the cart before the horse, um, if I have a chunk of uh, material, I want to put it as far away as I can, right? Now, say this is my center of rotation. Why don't I just fill this entire area with material to counterbalance it? Anyone know? Because the material right here is not doing anything. Most of the work of your counterbalance is being done out here. Okay? It makes no sense to put material close to the axis because it's not counterbalancing crap. But to put it out here, there isn't that much space. There isn't that much space out here, which is why you need a highly dense material. I want to take as much mass as I can and concentrate it in a single point mass out here. And to do that, I need a highly dense material. Is this clear to everyone? Uh, there are like f four or five parameters here in terms of lengths and densities and masses and volumes, so this gets complicated. So, let's review. I want to put a chunk of mass out here. The further out, the better. Say I'm constrained by my ge geometry. I'm going to put it somewhere along this link. I want to put it as far out as I can, but because I can't go further than that, I need it as dense as possible. So as much, as much density right at that point as possible. So what you're going to use is tungsten. The reason being, steel isn't heavy enough for a lot of counterbalance applications. If you get lucky and it is, terrific. Lead is denser, so uh, steel is 7.87 grams per cc, and then lead is 11.34, so that's steel. Why wouldn't we want to use lead? It's poisonous. It's, poisonous. it's highly poisonous. Don't use lead. Tungsten is 19.3. Okay, so this is almost three times denser than steel. What's the problem with this? Very expensive. Actually, it's not. It's pretty cheap. Really hard to machine. What can we do to the tungsten to make it easier to machine? Alloy. This 19.3 is 100% pure tungsten. Okay, there's something called. 18.5 tungsten. Anyone want to tell me what that means? It's mixed with something else to give you a density of 18.5 grams per cc. This is a standard alloy. I don't remember. I, I have the inspection form somewhere. I'm telling you, write this down now. If you remember stuff from this lecture, write this down. It took me months to track this little bastard down. When you call the company and you say, hey, I want to buy some tungsten and get it, make it, machine it into a counterbalance. They say, okay, well we sell tungsten, but you can't machine it. And then I called like 10 places, literally. And finally one of them said, uh, well you could use 18.5 tungsten. I'm like, what's that? Like, oh, that's the, the easily machinable version of tungsten. <laughs> I was like, really? Okay. <laughs> None of the other guys told me about that. So you don't buy pure tungsten. You buy like, I don't know, pure lead, but you don't buy pure tungsten. You buy 18.5 tungsten. If you say that, they'll understand what it means. If they don't, just tell them that's the density and then they'll say, ah, okay. This is way easier to machine than pure tungsten. Still though, if you take a chunk of 18.5 tungsten to a local machine shop, they probably won't do it. You, need, you still need some special tools to do it. So I think there's a place called like tungsten.com. Just Google machining tungsten. You want to send it to them, I had them do it. Um, for the they for including the material and the shop time, you literally can't get anywhere close to it at a local shop. This is all they do all day long is they machine tungsten. So if you're doing a, a counterbalance and you need high density, you can't use steel and you won't use lead because it's dangerous. You use tungsten and you get machined at like tungsten.com. Okay, okay. However, just because you can machine it doesn't mean you can machine whatever you want. 
you still want to keep things pretty tame. So this is a counterbalance for my robot. Notice that there are no strange curves. This is pretty, this is about as simple as you can get. This chamfer right here is actually kind of pushing what you can do in tungsten. And also the tolerances are very different in tungsten from like steel or aluminum. So don't try to get anything high precision because it's going to cost you an arm and a leg and tungsten chips. So you're going to get a beautiful part with chips taken out of it. Do you have threads in there? Nope, no threads. Tapping tungsten doesn't really happen. That's some crazy NASA stuff. You don't want to be doing crazy NASA stuff, including at NASA. Uh, you can do both. So you can either in-mill it or you can wire EDM it. Wire EDMing is actually pretty expensive depending on where you get it done. Um, that's, an, that's another mess of fish. How much does it cost? This was like 1200 bucks. You know, the part was about this big. And they, that was for everything, like shipping and material and machining is 1200 bucks. And everyone else refused to do it around here. Uh huh. What's the best shape of a Or does that depend on your robot? As close to a point as possible. So like, would a sphere be better than a circle like that? Or a cylinder like that? Um, typically, probably not a sphere because it's hard to get spheres. You either buy a sphere or you don't have it. No one really machines spheres. So, you know, typically it'll be a plate like this. Okay. So, but let's go back to the sand idea. I like the sand idea because I can adjust it. The problem with this is we machine it and we're done. We'll, we'll put a slot on it, but say I don't have enough room for big slot and I don't want to keep getting tungsten machined, what else could I do? I could do sand, that's cool, but that's messy and it's not particularly precise. It's also not very dense. I don't know what the density is, but it's not very high. Do they list glass on here? I, I could, yeah. Any other ideas for what we could do? So I like that idea. So what we could do, in fact, maybe I'll just show you the CAD. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I have a steel chunk that does not move. It does not change. Then I have a tungsten chunk <coughs> that can move along the slot. So I have a basically a DC component that never changes and then for fine tuning I do a move a little mass. And this is good because you don't want to take off your whole mass because the robot might just collapse and fall over. You just want to be able to fine tune half the mass or a quarter of the mass. And someone mentioned spheres and tungsten. What is the, what is the most natural form you can think of? Combine the ideas of sand and spheres of tungsten and tell me what you get. You get shot. This is tungsten shot. So I have, you know, three millimeter size and one millimeter size, and then this is like a really fine powder. Yeah, it's okay. They're two bags. Okay, sand is a bad idea. Don't do it. It will get in your bearings, and you will be dead. This is hard stuff. But I actually tested this. They have basically no particulate matter in here, other than just the spheres. So you know when you get sand, you get chunky sand, and then you get this fine powder that blows everywhere? This doesn't have that fine powder. Plus it's non-toxic. Even if it did have a fine powder and you got it into your lungs, it's not going to like poison you like lead will. So this is what everybody's switching over to now. They're getting rid of their lead and they're replacing it with tungsten shot because I can now, I can make my own counterbalance that's super freaking dense. And it's pretty clean. Someone tell me what the problem with this is. What is the density of this? Is this 18.5? What is it? Like 70%. What do you say? Like 70%. Like some percent of that. Rob's PF time. Packing factor. Any of you who were forced to take a materials class know that when you pack little spheres together, they don't make one solid mass. So Say I have a giant sphere. If I take lead, I can smelt it down and fill this and have a giant uh, spherical chunk of lead. And you can do that. It's low, low melting point. Or I can take lead shot, which is non-toxic, and I can fill with lots of little balls. Okay? Now these little gaps here, that's air. So that's lost mass. 
So go on Wikipedia and there's some mathematician whose name is associated with it. I don't remember what it is. I think th there's a theoretical limit in terms of there are special ways of doing this and in involving epoxy and different, like, we could take little spheres and put little spheres in here and then we could take the fine sand and put the fine sand in here. So it's big spheres, little, medium spheres, little spheres, and sand. And we could increase, this is called the packing factor, is basically what percentage of this volume we can fill up with actual mass. There's a theoretical limit for spheres of the same size. I don't remember what it is. I think it's about 64%. You're just not going to get more than mathematically. And then there's like a practical limit, which is more around 60%. Now, I don't completely remember. I seem to recall if you take tungsten shot at uh, whatever density it is I bought this at, I think this was 17 grams per cc, and then you account for 60% packing factor, you are still denser than pure lead, filling up 100% of the space. So I take tungsten shot, it's clean, it doesn't make a mess everywhere, I can adjust my counterbalance, even without any type, this is, oh, 60% is for what's called random packing. So the 64, or this might be 68, something like that, is for, I have, I stack the little spheres like a watchmaker, okay? This is for random packing. This is literally like, I just, I hold open the bag and you just start shoving it in and I, that's randomly packed and that's about 60%. 60% of the density you buy from this company uh, and you end up still denser than pure lead. So that's why you do that. I think this is called tungstenheavypowder.com or tungstenballs.com. It's something like that. Uh huh. Can you then, because like this is basically <coughs> half of your density, so you're losing a lot mm -hmm. of space. Can you do like a combination at that point that you know you will require this much and then I can adjust exactly. with the shots? Exactly. So that's precisely what I have in my dissertation robot is I have a, one of them I have like a solid chunk that I know, okay, this is like three quarters of my weight and then the remainder uh, I can set with some tungsten shot. Any, anyone, has anyone ever done an op amp circuit and you set the uh, transconductance with um, the, uh, or gain with the resistors? Remember you're not supposed to, and, and some of the resistors if this is our op amp, this resistor here is a potentiometer. Do you ever put just a potentiometer? When you turn the potentiometer all the way down to zero, it explodes. It starts smoking. So what you do is you put in series, you put a little fixed resistor with a potentiometer. This is the mechanical analog. We put a fixed counterweight that can't be changed. The mass doesn't change. The slot doesn't change. And then we put a shot for the little bit that does change, just to fine tune it. Can you, can you have a, you know, like what you showed up on your previous diagram, like a slotted mass and then just rotate that mass? Uh, yeah, you do that. So you're just changing where the center of mass is. Okay. All right, so let's see what else I got. Does anyone have any questions thus far? Uh, real quickly. Yeah. So if, if the gold standard is like, having a block of tungsten, right? Yeah. What's the next level down where you don't actually want to spend 20 Block of steel. Okay. You can get steel shot. I, I've, I have multiple steel counterbalances in my dissertation robot because I have the room. I, felt, I saw some blank looks before with, with this, so I'm, I'm going to do this. This will be my closing thing. Um, Okay. A mass here has less counterbalancing than a mass here. Right? So I want to put all my mass here. To get that mass, if I have a low density material, I might have to have a giant counterbalance that reaches all the way here, right? Say at the center of mass, I'm here. I don't want that big of a material. I have to buy it. It's expensive. Like stainless steel is ridiculously expensive. Okay, and then I have to machine, I have to take up the volume. What I'd like is to put a point mass there of infinite density of whatever um, you know, mass I want. The best thing I can do is tungsten. It's the smallest, most compact, most dense material that you can actually machine and put in there. You can do shot if you want to make it adjustable. 
Um, oh, the reason I wrote the inertia thing down before is just remember you're adding inertia. So it's all well and good that this is counterbalanced, but now if you want to be doing some crazy tap dancing on the dude's retina or chokar, that tap dancing is going to slow down. So if you're trying to do very quick motions, that inertia is going to slow down your ability and your slew rate. So that's why sometime I wrote inertia on here. How could we have a lower inertia counterbalance? A spring. But then the spring has, so the spring is much lower mass. It's much more compact depending on how we do it. But then um, you don't want your medical robot being turned sideways and doing that. Okay, I think that's it for today. So the next day, I know I've been telling you we're going to talk about springs every day for two weeks. But I swear to God, next Wednesday, uh, this coming Wednesday, we really, truly will discuss springs. And that will be sweet. Good for, uh, weeks. Uh huh. Can I ask you a question about that? Uh huh. So, I'm actually designing.